in back for a uh, whole stack of green pamphlets. That's the next lecture series, so take them up and look at it. And, uh, I think there's probably some things on there that might interest everybody here. Um, I mentioned the last time, and I, I'm going to mention it again, uh, I've had an innumerable amount of people uh, comment about how nice the lecture series has been and how they've enjoyed the lecture chair series. Uh, this series is a result of Dr. James Kenney and Frank Slayton's administration of St. Joe. And, uh, their desire to have the college evolve the lecture series that the community would enjoy and participate in that would benefit people here. And I really think if you've enjoyed it, and I have, I think most of you have, uh, I think they deserve a round of applause. This will be the seventh lecture. Okay, business matters. Before I forget that, the students, those that haven't talked to me, you can turn your... We ended up with Charlie Howell. Tonight is the Charlie Howell's election. Uh, there's some new faces tonight. Uh, the Jasper County Republican Chairman, Kenny Culp, is here tonight. He's also one of our county commissioners. He's sitting over here. It's nice to have one of the professional politicians up here uh, for, the, for this lecture. Uh, when I was a little boy growing up, we got our first TV set. I remember once a week, my dad would turn this TV set to Channel 3. Now, in our area, Channel of you who uh, can you you can hear me all right without uh, without the mic in the back can you hear me all right OK 
Okay. For those of you who uh, who need notes, I I don't have a lot of notes. I've got enough, but I've what I've really got is some statistics about the second congressional district, about. Uh, uh, the, the pluses and minuses of the various campaigns that Charlie Halleck was involved in, and uh, uh, enough said. Now I also have here, and I, I'd, like to, I'd like for all of you to take these home because we've got too many of these. <laughs> we've got, um, this is the program for this little memory lane basketball sectional that we run, you know. And uh, so we're out of them. I mean, we're out of the tournament, and we've got about three or four boxes of this sitting around in my mother's bedroom. And so you're welcome to take these home. And the reason I brought them here tonight is because on page seven, there is a, a, a picture of Congressman Halleck plus a, uh, a page here on major accomplishments of his life. And then on page, the next two pages, are the pictures of the 15 people to date that have received scholarships from this effort. So uh, they, they each, we're given $5,000 a year out in scholarships to five different high schools in the area as a result of this, of this effort. So I, I really would like for you to load up as many of these as you want and, uh, and take them with you. Winston Churchill said once, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, he said there are three impossible tasks in this world. One is to climb a, a wall leaning towards you. The second is to kiss a lady leaning away from you. And the third is to come to a man's hometown where everybody knows him better than you do and try to do justice to his life. And so I'm in that very, I'm in that very embarrassing situation tonight. Now the judge should have done this because he knows he knew Charlie Halleck better than I did, and and uh, certainly Father Bannett would have been a better speaker than I am, and Jim Beaver would have been far better. But all of those people, you see, have weaseled out of this, and I am the person I am the person who uh, uh, have been picked to do it. And I want to tell you this: as far as as far as I am concerned, I consider this a distinct honor, and it has been. Uh, uh, very enlightening to me to refresh my memory. One other uh, thing. It is a lie when you say that I am a Halleck historian. I am an admirer of Congressman Halleck and I knew him when I was waiting tables at the Sportsman Restaurant as a boy and he would be 95 this year. I'm 60 and so you can see that uh, where this falls in. What I'd like to do I've got some notes here, and I'd like to go over the notes and uh, uh, take his life, chronological order, as quickly as I can, up to about 1968. I've told the judge that at, five, at 8 o'clock he's supposed to give me the hook. We will stop then, take a break. If it takes a few more minutes after that, well, it'll take a few more minutes. And then after that, I've got a couple, two or three stories of my own. Kenny Culp was graciously... Uh, agreed to come here tonight and to tell a few stories. Larry Carter, who was Congress, ha Congressman Halleck's friend and recommended by Jim and Carol Beaver, is here this evening. And so, and then we'd like for you to join in and, and wind up the evening with just telling uh, Congressman Halleck's stories. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we'll, we'll all uh, help one another in that regard. Charlie Halleck was born August the 22nd, 1900. He was born in DeMott, Indiana. And he, his father's name was Abraham, and his mother's name was Laura, but she was known as Bertie. Grandfather Halleck, his, uh, Abraham's father, James, was uh, a native of Kankakee County in Illinois, and then they moved to Newton County and came to Lake Village. And at that time, there was a 35 acre, there was a 35 square mile lake north of Morocco called Beaver Lake. And they dug a ditch about 12 to 15 feet wide from Beaver Lake to the Kankakee River. I see you're nodding, and I'm very happy to see that somebody agrees with me here. But anyway, <laughs> they, they dug this ditch, and it was to drain this 35, 35 square miles so they could farm it. And Grandfather Halleck 
set a sawmill, put a water wheel in on this ditch, and then set his, his farm was astride of this, and then he set a sawmill up there, and that's the way he made his living, was on, was as a uh, sawn lumber and so forth on this uh, beaver ditch that ran from the lake to the Kankakee River. Abraham was born in 1860, and he was born right after Abraham Lincoln had been elected president. So it was obvious that the Halleck's, who were Republicans to start with, and conservative in the second phase, would name their son Abraham. So he got his name from Abraham Lincoln. He went to school at a one-room schoolhouse in Morocco, Indiana. And by the time he was 18, he was already teaching grammar school and going to uh, Central Normal College at Danville, Indiana. Four years after that, he studied the law under a, a judge, uh, a local judge, and four years after that, at the age of 24, Abraham Halleck uh, was admitted to the Indiana Bar. Grandfather Halleck was a commissioner in Newton County. Abraham Halleck then moved to DeMott. And he lived in, and he worked in DeMott. He was in business with his brother. And they were in the grain and hay and uh, implement business. He was also, uh, they were the founders, he and his brothers were the founders of the first telephone company in Jasper County. It was called the Halleck Telephone Company. And it was between DeMont and Wheatfield and Nyman. <laughs> uh, my students, I told them these stories today and they, they didn't believe that Nyman was ever big enough to have anything going on there, but they, I assured them that it was. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, again, he was one of nine, he was one of nine um, children. He was elected. Abraham was elected commissioner in 1896 and served for nine years. He was a short, plump, slow-moving, deliberate man. He loved kids and he played the harmonica. And they said that you would see him playing as the bear comes over the mountain and different things, little kids singing with him all the time. He loved to camp and he took Charles and Charlie and their family on overnight camping trips a lot. And Emil Hanley, who was later the mayor of Rensselaer, is quoted as saying that old man Halleck knew every tree there was. In 1903, he moved to Rensselaer, and he started his law practice. In 1908, he was elected state senator from White, Jasper, Stark, and Newton County, and he served two, ten, two terms in that capacity. During that time, he became very interested in the Jasper County Courthouse, which was being built at that time. And he was a person who was interested in, uh, uh, took personal interest in the marble and the wood and the leaded glass that you see in the Jasper County Courthouse at this day, at this time. Now, Charlie's mother was Laura I. Luce, and he was, she was known as Bertie. She was also a teacher. She taught music at the North Star School, and she was an accomplished violin, piano, and harmonica player. The Halleck's had five children. Three daughters were born first, Mildred, Hester, and Laura. Charles was the fourth one born, born and Harold was the fifth born to the family. She read law books and typed legal abstracts in uh, Abraham's office, and she was admitted to the, her, the bar herself. And so she then became an associate of Mr. Halleck, and so they were both lawyers, and that's the way they made their living uh, in, in Rensselaer. She was about five foot five, slender, quick-minded, quiet, and reserved. Charlie's brother, Harold, said she was behind the throne. It's also been said that Charlie inherited his talent for practical politics from Abe, but the energy and ambition from Bertie. Now, Charlie always said, he said, I was born with a political spoon in my mouth. I'm not running for any political office, but should I be elected, I would be happy to serve to the best of my ability. <laughs> 
Charlie's childhood, he was called Abe until he got through college. This is Charlie. He was called Abe. His middle name was Charles Abraham Halleck, and he was called Abe by his friends. And he was, a, uh, as a young person, he was a mischievous lad. And in the third grade, it is a matter of recorded history that he did throw worms at the little girls. And he pulled pears off of Mel LaRue's tree. And he threw snowballs at H.F. Parker's tall hat as he was uh, walking around the courthouse. He earned his money by delivering the Rensselaer Republican. And he made 10 cents a day at that. And he uh, took his profit and bought his first bicycle from the 10 cents a day profit. He was the smartest boy in his class. In the eighth grade, he had 19 A's, four B's, two C's, and one D. D was in music. And they said he whispered too much. In Rensselaer High School, he continued his fine academic record. And I, I thought you'd be interested in light. I'm a teacher and have been interested in education for 30-some years. I thought you'd be interested in this, in what he took in high school, and compare it with today's fine curriculum that we have for the young people. He took math for three years, English for three years, German for three years, history for three years, Latin for two years, chemistry for one year, botany for one year, shorthand for one year, typing for one year. Where is the advanced physical training? Where is the weight, you know, the weight lifted? Where is the uh, uh, golf? Where is, where, where is life skills? And where is all this other things that we teach kids today that don't mount to hoops in a, two hoops in a rain barrel? You see, he came away and he was an educated man. And it was very basic stuff. And in, in, that, in those endeavors, he, he got 32 A's, 10 B's, 3 C's. All the C's were in music. And he was an ex, in extracurricular. He was a very good debater. And he, he was on the football team as a guard, an end and a half back, a captain on the football team. He was the uh, editor-in-chief of the yearbook of the Rensselaer High School. And I thought again, uh, Rensselaer in those days, listen to this, they played Morocco and Kentland, but then listen to this, they also played Logan Sports, South Bend, and Hammond. And, Log and Hammond had one school, Hammond High. And South Bend had one school, South Bend Central. And Rensselaer went right in there, Charlie Halleck, and they played them. You see, today they'd be scared to death to take those boys that far or take those boys to go play somebody that big. It'd be terrible. <coughs> In the county spelling bee, he did very well till he hit the word scarcely. And uh, he, he didn't do a very good job. I thought that was interesting in light of some of the recent political candidates that we've had. Uh, the media in those days must not have thought it was very important to be able to spell because he certainly had a fine career after he flunked spelling here in the county spelling bee. And uh, Dan Quayle, because he couldn't uh, spell potato right, and I've spelled it with an E all my life too, uh, uh, he was supposedly not, not, an, uh, not good enough to be vice president or be president of the country. <laughs> Harold said, his brother said, that the debate team started the whole thing. It was the start of his whole career, political career. It's also interesting, I thought, his, his uh, debate teacher, Miss Shedd, said that he, was, he had a very good, quick mind standing on his feet. He could think standing on his feet. Also, it's interesting to note that uh, they went to Monticello, and Charlie would, he was on the track team, and they would have a track meet, and then they would debate, or they would have a debate, and then they'd have a track team. Why, in today's world, that'd be unheard of. We'd have to take a bus for the debate team, and a bus for the track team, and then another bus for the girls' team, and then my, the heaven forget if they, for, forbid if they'd ever get together, and the academic folks would miss, mix it up with the, with the athletics, or vice versa, you see? I, I wonder sometimes whether we're really doing better or doing worse as we go forward. He joined the Army immediately after graduating from high school. And he was a, uh, went in as a private, came out as a second lieutenant. So the Army saw something important to him, too. He entered Indiana Law School, or Indiana University in 1918. He lived at a boarding house. And meals there cost 20, 25 cents. You'd get a real good meal in, in Bloomington. He wanted to be in a fraternity. And he was a poor boy from Rensselaer, Indiana. And he, he uh, contacted three, rushed three fraternities, 
Two of them turned him down and the other one didn't even bother to talk to him. And he wrote his mother and he said this is what he had to say. He said it takes a lot of pull from some prominent member. One must smoke and swear and shoot craps and throw quarters for the crack in order to get into some of these fraternities. He, he wondered out loud whether he was too slow for him. And then he, he wondered about his personal appearance. It was a tremendous blow to this boy. And then he set about doing something that shows you what he's made out of. He, he became determined to become very, very good student. And he compiled one of the best academic records that Indiana University has seen. He also became involved in everything that he could on the campus. And I'm not going to go into all the things because that would take another half an hour. But I can tell you this, that as a junior, he was elected president by the student union. And as president of the student union, he was only the second independent. That means he was the only the second non-fraternity man to ever hold that job in the 64-year history of Indiana University to that date. He, he also, in his junior year, was nominated for Phi Beta Kappa and the, uh, the academic honorary, and he was only one of 10, he was one of 10 of 450 to receive that honor. Now you see the tables have turned. And the betas, who were the best, best fraternity supposedly on campus, he didn't have to call them, they called him. And they said, we'd love to have you in our fraternity. My guy, Sheer Yard, president of the student union, Phi Beta Kappa. So he joined the betas and he was, a, as a senior, he was in the beta, Theta Pi uh, fraternity. And uh, interesting to note that there were two people there that were his brothers, that were uh, fraternity brothers. Um, Paul McNutt, who we'll hear about later, and Wendell Wilkie were both members of that, of that fraternity. He fired furnaces. He waited tables, and he did hard labor in the summer in order to get through school. He was one of three people in his class to be selected for the Rhodes, to, for, as Indiana's candidates for the Rhodes Scholars. He did not receive that honor. He was too busy for girls. He did, however, once in a while get around to seeing a couple, and he went up to Butler one night and was talking to a girl and, and a sophomore and finally invited her out for a moonlight walk, and he was gone for about three hours and came back, and her roommate said, uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, he was a pretty good catch. He was pretty good looking, excellent student, a leader in the uh, student uh, community. And so her, this girl's roommate said, well, what happened? And the girl said, nothing, darn it. <laughs> said all he did was talk about being president of the United States. <laughs> so see, early on, this man was thinking about being president of the United States. He. Uh, he did find one girl there on the Indiana campus that seemed to like the way he courted women. Her name is Blanche White. She was the daughter of a, <clears throat> of a realtor and um, a real estate guy in, in uh, Indianapolis. And they often went to the library and he talked to her about politics and went down to a place where Hoagie Carmichael was playing a piano. This morning I talked to this about to my classes and they said, who? And I said, well, that was before the Beatles, and so you people wouldn't know what, what we're talking about, but when I get tonight, well, people know who Cole the Hoagie Carmichael was. I told him that he was, you know, he was buried with honors by, by uh, Indiana University, and certainly one of the most distinguished grads. Charlie Halley graduated cum laude, sixth in a class of 450, and in 1922, he entered law school. In 1924, he graduated from law school with the highest academic average of anyone in his class. And as he went up to get his diploma, he proudly presented in his hip pocket the necessary papers for filing to be prosecuting attorney for Jasper New Newton County. Had them right there in his hip pocket and showed everybody. <laughs> as his, as his uh, one of his professors told him, he said, Charlie, you go back to Rensselaer you practice law and you take every opportunity that you get to, to do public speaking. And so he did that. He was easily elected 
uh, to the prosecuting attorneys. He ran in the primary, he ran unopposed, and in the general election, he beat the Democratic opponent uh, 3,755 to 1875. He was prosecutor of this county and Newton County for 10 years. There was two things that I picked up in reading about it. Uh, he was particularly hard on bootleggers, and he was particularly hard on thieves, and not for the same reason. He said, I don't think there's any secret to anyone in this group that Charlie Halleck drank, and liked to drink whiskey, scotch whiskey, because as a waiter I brought it to him. <laughs> but he said, he said, I was as dry then as I am wet now. And so he and the sheriff, the, boot, the bootleggers, would run from Indianapolis to Chicago with the, on the runs, and so he and the sheriff would hide, and they would snap these guys up. And the reason that he prosecuted these people was because that he got a $25 bonus for every one that he put in jail. So he was padding his pockets, you see. And uh, uh, the reason that he was so tough on thieves was because these two counties are farming counties. And a long time ago, uh, uh, in, Ab in uh, James's time, there were a lot of horse thieves up in around uh, what's now the Slough, Willow Slough. There was horse thieves there, and they were a bad bunch of people. And so the people finally organized vigilantes and went up there and ran them off, and they went out to Missouri and continued to do business. But anyway, they hated thieves in this neck of the woods, and Charlie figured that out. So. There was one time he was prosecuting a man from Morocco that had been accused of stealing chickens. And uh, one of the ladies on the jury was from Morocco and she knew this man and did not disqualify herself and so consequently as a result, it was a hung jury. And just one juror was, was against putting this man in jail. So Charlie, not to be outdone and remembering that he was going to, be going to have to stand for election the next time and not wanting to be known as being easy on thieves, he hardly got out of the courtroom and he prosecuted him again. He got a more favorable jury and he put him in jail because he wanted to make sure he got him. He was married on June the 15th, 1927, and two years later, uh, the Halleck's had their only children, twins, Patsy and Chuck Jr. were born. It's interesting to know how he got to get to, to Congress. It's interesting, uh, I've heard a lot of times, I've been a coach all my life. A lot of guys have said I'd rather be lucky than be a good coach. And I'm not too sure that's, that's not right. But here are, the events, here are the events that led to Charlie Halleck going to Congress. First of all, there was a man by the name of Will R. Wood and he had been in Congress for uh, either 12 or 14 years, and he was a good congressman. And this was in the, the 10th Congressional District at that time. Well, Wood R. Will R. Wood used his influence to carve out what was then, then, was then called the second Congressional District. And so they gerrymandered it up, and it was an absolutely guaranteed Republican haven. In fact, they called it the Will R. Wood Republican Oasis, is what they called it after they got done with it. Well, he no more got the thing carved out, and the Depression comes along. Roosevelt runs in 32, and Will R. Wood got beat. Now, you would think, well, not a big problem, because if the man had stature and it was a Republican territory, he could just run again. But guess what? Four days after he was out of Congress, he died. So now he's out of the picture, you see. And there was a, the, the man that won was a man by the name of George Durgan from Lafayette, and he was the mayor of Lafayette. So Durgan served in Congress in this district, the second district, for two years. And then in 1934, a man by the name of Frederick, uh, Frederick Landis from Logansport ran as a Republican, and he beat Durgan. So he's getting ready to go to Congress. Nine days after the election, he died of pneumonia. <laughs> now think of that. So now we got to have a special election. Now remember I told you that Paul V. McNutt's name would come up again. Well, he, by this time, he is now governor of Indiana, Charlie Halleck's uh, fraternity buddy, or fraternity brother, not buddy, but brother. And so, 
<laughs> McNutt wanted to be president, or he certainly wanted to be more than governor of Indiana. So what he did, he set the special election for January 29th because Franklin Delano Roosevelt's was, birthday was on the 30th. And so what he wanted to do, you see, was to bring this election back to Durgan and then call up Roosevelt and said, Happy birthday, Mr. President. This is Paul V. McNutt calling, and we've got a special birthday present for you from the 2nd Congressional District in Indiana. Another, another Democratic congressman for you. Well, he didn't take, didn't take into consideration his old fraternity brother. brother. Now, to get, on the ballot, to get on the ballot, Halleck went to the, there was 13 counties in the 2nd District, and so he had to get the county chairman, uh, there was a caucus of them, and he had to win their approval. And his main opponent was the widow of Landis. Her name was Bessie Landis. So he, he went there, and I'm not going to go through all the thing, but it's very close. And finally, the vote that got it for him, he had a high school classmate as the county chairman in Lafayette, and at the last minute, this guy changed his vote, and so Charlie's on the ballot now. So now he went around and campaigned as hard as he campaigned. And Landis, by the way, won by 5,000 votes. Special election, Charlie wins. He wins by about 5,000 votes, so he didn't lose anything, see? And so, <clears throat> interesting to note, too, the election cost Halleck $700. That's how, much it, that's how much the whole election to get him to go to Congress was $700. He got $500 from George Ball, the industrialist in Muncie, and the pros in Indianapolis told George Ball when he sent the $500, said, you're throwing money down a rat hole. <laughs> and Charlie then spent $200 of his own money, and so he got elected with expenses of $700. Now McNutt, in the meantime, spent tons of money because he had a little scam at that time. Anybody that worked for the state, 2% of their salary went to the Democratic uh, kitty, and then they used that kitty to elect other Democrats around over the, the state of Indiana. And they used a ton of that money up here in these counties trying to beat Charlie Halleck, but he beat him. And they said, they went down to the square up here on the courthouse that night, and Rents Leard never had a congressman before. And they were all happy, and they had a bonfire, and here it is, middle of, or last of January, and Halleck and his friends threw their hats in the fire. They were so happy, and burned their hats up. And then two days later, well, Abraham Halleck, they gathered at the railroad station, and they made a little speech. Abraham told everybody how proud he was of his boy. Charlie made a little longer speech. Bertie waved goodbye, and he got on the train and went to, went to Washington. <laughs> a week later, he came back to Indianapolis, and he spoke to the Republican Editorial Association in Indianapolis. And at the end of the speech, somebody asked him, said, how do you like being up there with all those Democrats? And he said, well, it's kind of like, like being a banny rooster in a barnyard full of horses. He said, I called them all together and said, gentlemen, Let's be careful and not step on one another. <laughs> he, uh, he, he didn't get any important committee assignments because he was too late to get any of those. But that was good because then he could uh, do his work on the floor. He spoke most, oh, uh, Blanche went with him, and uh, it cost $230 rent for an apartment. And then they had signs out in front of the apartments that said, dogs allowed, no children. <laughs> and that's the truth. So anyway, she came back to Rensselaer and stayed here for a while, and he, put up, he, he set up headquarters in a hotel up there. Um, the first time that he spoke on the floor of the, of the house, he spoke against a bill that would have made it, le made it legal or made it mandatory that all income tax returns be public. In other words, they would be able to come and say, well, you made such and such last year, and they'd be able to go through and figure out what you made and what you paid and your expenses, so forth and so on. And he spoke against that, and, the, and it went down to defeat. The second time he spoke on the, the House floor, he spoke out for a $9,500 grant to be given to Mrs. Landis, because she had been, she was the widow, 
And there was some debate about that, but a man by the name of McCormick from Massachusetts stood, Democrats stood, and he said, we ought to do this. And so the Democrat that carried the day, and so Mrs. Landis then was given a year's salary for her husband who, who had passed away by the Congress. Uh, he became early known in Washington as Available Charlie. If there was a speech, he would make it. He, he was happy to speak anywhere. And uh, uh, he, he spoke, uh, I've got a few of his uh, stump speeches, that, uh, you know, the stump phrases that he used, and uh, I thought they were pretty good. It said, he spoke out against the New Deal, again a conservative. He said, we got 114 new federal agencies, 250,000 new federal employees, billions spent in unworkable, unconstitutional enterprises, $22 billion spent, 12 million still unemployed, 200,000 government employees have not taken the civil service test. We need less government in business and more business in government. He also spoke, uh, he, he got in a dispute with Jim Farley. This is the first time his name ever came up in the national news. And Jim Farley, of course, was Roosevelt's uh, postmaster general and also the, the, uh, the chairman, the national chairman for the Democratic Party. And what he did, he sent a letter out to all the postmasters all over the country and told them to send him $25 and they were going to, they were going to uh, uh, run Roosevelt's 36 campaign with this money. And uh, Halley called his hands on it. Well, here's a freshman congressman talking to a very powerful guy, and so Farley denied it. He said, this is a bunch of baloney. I deny this. Halley went to the floor of Congress, had a letter, waved it in front of the, in front of the, 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 the House. And Farley said, well, it must have been one of my lieutenants using my signature stamp. He said, I certainly didn't do it. And then he apologized and then withdrew the order. So in his first little battle with the Democrats, well, he got them in the, on the retreat right off the bat. Halleck, you know, he, you're not going to do this without developing enemies. And they called him Halleck the Smart Alec. And then they said he's nothing but a ditch lawyer and he's dredging up more mud for us. <laughs> One quote that I read, he said, if the Democratic platform had measles, the New Deal performance never got close enough to catch it. In 1936, he won again, but only by 5,000 votes. He came back here, campaigned hard, and he won by, he only won by 5,000 votes, but when he went back to the House, there was only 88 Republicans out of 435 in the House. It's the lowest number of Republicans ever in the history in the House of Representatives. And so he, he did, he had this thing, he did this thing which he called the, uh, the caucus in a phone booth. And I want to read that to you because I've heard him in his speeches, I heard him refer to this several times, and so I I'll read you. See, he was the only Republican from Indiana in the Congress. The two senators were Democratic and all the members of the House were Democratic except him. And he said, let me find this thing. He, he wrote this for the Rensselaer Republican. He says, I called a caucus of the Indiana Republican delegation and picked out a fancy telephone booth for the meeting. It was all very informal. I didn't have to rap for order once and I dispensed with the formality of selecting a delegation ch chairman. I jotted the minutes of the meetings on the wall of the phone booth, picked my own committee assignments, and walked out. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> now, I heard him speak uh, several times, and he, he would uh, invariably, someplace in the speech, as I recall, he would mention that caucus. I was there when we had to caucus the Indiana delegation in a phone booth. And he said, we don't want to go back to that. In 1936, Roosevelt made the biggest political error that he made in his whole career, in my judgment. He tried to pack the Supreme Court. And when he did that, all of these people, all these Democrats, split. Because the South already had the Supreme Court packed anyway. So what they did 
The South and the Southern Democrats joined with the 88 Republicans and they voted and they beat Roosevelt's attempt to pack the Supreme Court, you see, because the Supreme Court was ruling unconstitutional all of the New Deal legislation that was passed between 32 and 36. In 1938, Halleck again came back to Indiana and campaigned and by this time he was really on the farm prices because you see farm prices were 25 percent lower than they had been during Hoover, Coolidge, and Harding's administration. And so his stump speech that year contained the following. Let the New Deal explain the 20 cent oats and the 30 cent corn and the 50 cent wheat. Let them tell you about that. His opponent was Thomas Stonebreaker from Cass County and now he started, see, he started whipping people. He, gets, he beats him by 21,000 votes. So now he's on his way. There's no more 5,000 vote pluralities in the second district. Joe Martin the same year became the House Minority Leader and Halleck was his trusted aide. So we now start to see Halleck and Martin joining up together and we're going to see if that's going to stay together. In 1940, the Democrats conceded the second congress congressional district because they said we can't beat him. And there was editorials that appeared over the district that said, in Democratic newspapers, that said uh, wanted a candidate to take a drinking from Mr. Halleck. The 1940 was the first time that he, that he became prominent in the convention, and it came about this way. Dewey was running, and Taft was running, and there was Wendell Wilkie was running. But Wendell Wilkie had always been a Democrat. But then he saw a chance, you see, and so he changed uh, parties uh, shortly before 1940. Um, on these, on um, April 23rd, a poll showed that Dewey had 67%. He was a choice of 67% of the people. And Wilkie only had 3%, and Taft was like 30%. Dewey and Taft never met in the primary. I found that to be extremely interesting. That's one thing that I, that I learned in this. So in 40, the, the primaries were spread out in such a, that they didn't file and so forth and so on. So the, those two men never met head on in a primary. So they come to the, they're coming to the convention. Wilkie has not announced that he is going to be a presidential candidate. Halleck sees him on June the 12th now. The, the convention's on June the 26th. He sees him on June the 12th in Washington at a press meeting there. And as he's walking up to make his remarks, he says, Wendell, if you want to run for president, I'll nominate you. And so Wilkie goes up and announces to the press club at Washington, he said, I'm going to run for president, and my friend Charlie Halleck's going to nominate me. And they said the whole place, the, all the reporters jumped up and run out of the room because this was the headlines for the day, see, because Wilkie had never announced he was going to run. A New York person, a New York writer, said Dewey was, had the most delegates, Taft the most kingmakers, and Wilkie the most enthusiasm. <clears throat> There's a little story here I'm going to tell you. It's a little risque, but I think you people are old enough to handle this. Uh, Wilkie was the first man to run around through the, the convention headquarters and shake hands and try to change delegates' minds at the convention with his personal presence. So he was at a hotel, and the Indiana delegation was there, and there was a man by the name of Jim Watson who had been a senator from Indiana before Roosevelt got in and threw them all out. And he was, had been Senate Majority Leader, either under Harding or Coolidge. So he was in the hotel and Wilkie come up to him and he said, uh, uh, I understand you're not supporting me. And uh, uh, Watson said, no, I am not. And Wilkie said, well, as we're both from Indiana, I hope that you would support me. And Watson said, I'll tell you why. You've been a Democrat all your life and I don't mind the church converting a whore but I don't like her to lead the choir the first night. <laughs> so, so on June 26 at 9.15 p.m., Halleck gave his speech. Now you gotta remember that Wilkie is, un, is very unpopular with the delegation, I mean the, 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 the pros. But the Wilkie people were smart. 
There, it was before the day of TV, of course, and radio was there. And so what they did, they packed the galleries. So when Halleck Halle got up to speak, the, the people on the floor booed him and cat calls and traitor and all this stuff. But the people in the, in the gallery, he mentioned Wilkie's name early on, which was another break from the tradition. And then the, the gallery started, we want Wilkie, we want Wilkie. Well, the people on the radio, that's all they heard. We want Wilkie. And so he had an 18-minute speech. It took 45 minutes because they couldn't get things quieted down because these people were raving, raving and ranting around in the galleries. And so it's one of the political marvels in, in uh, American political history that Wilkie won the nomination because Taft and Dewey then became deadlocked. Wilkie won the nomination. And Halleck, of course, was given a lot of credit because uh, because he nominated him, and the Chicago Tribune said that he gave the best speech, gave the best speech at the convention. Wilkie was from Elwood. They kicked off the 1940 campaign in Elwood, 200,000 people there. Charlie Halleck gave a small address. Wilkie started out campaigning, and there were two things that happened that beat him. I think he was, I think he would have been president, but as he, as he went along, instead of staying conservative, he got more and more toward Roosevelt, particularly in international affairs. And the other thing, he got a terrible throat ailment. He couldn't talk. And so he would be there, but he couldn't speak. And Halleck gave some of his speeches, but it wasn't, Halleck, Halleck wasn't really speaking the way he wanted to speak because he was a conservative. And in the end, <clears throat> Wilkie and Halleck uh, were not friends. Uh, Wilkie got mad at Halleck because he voted against the draft extension and also voted against, Halleck voted against Lynn Lees. Once the war started though, Halleck went right down the line with the administration voting for a short war. He wanted to get the war over with and he wanted to get it over with with the least amount of casualties. That's the way, that was the two things that he said we got to get done. In 1942, he, uh, he won by 23,000 votes over a man from Lafayette. 1940, he became, uh, here's another thing, luck. In, 19, just be, in 1943, the chairman of the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, Bill Ditter, was a congressman from Pennsylvania. He was killed in a plane crash. Guess who was available? Available Charlie. They make him the, uh, the chairman of this. Now there's $300,000 in the kitty. So he went about the, the country signing checks for these congressional Republicans trying to win in the, in the congressional uh, races. And so he got himself, again, a lot of IOUs, a lot of political clout here because of this situation. Dewey and Bricker were on the ticket for the Republicans run against Roosevelt in 44. Wilkie died in October, right in the middle of the campaign. And Roosevelt won his fourth term. And Halleck won over James O. Cox by almost 30,000 votes now. You see what's happening here. He's doing a job, and the people in the district are sending him back with bigger and bigger majorities. He could have been the Republican national chairman. But he, he meant he would have had to resign his seat. He refused to do that. In 1946, Halleck was absent from the district <clears throat> almost all the time because he was campaigning for congressional, cam for, for congressional candidates all over the country. He was one of the great stump speechers, speech, speakers in the Republican Party, without a doubt. And uh, he, he beat a lady from Delphi by 25,000 votes and wasn't even here. And the Republicans now win the House and the Senate. So now Joe Martin becomes Speaker of the House and Halleck becomes Majority Leader. So you see that relationship. Well, darn it, time is running out. I was going to read you all the things that a Majority Leader does. It's unbelievable. It's a paragraph that thick. I'm not going to do it. He moved into bigger offices. 
he was, he was the man that drafted the Taft-Hartley Act. He drafted the Taft-Hartley Act. And Taft asked him to do it. He hired a guy by the name of Gary Morgan, and that, that man was the man who was in, uh, headed up the project. But the, he was very proud of that. The Taft-Hartley Act, of course, stood for 50 years as the basic piece of labor management legislation. Somebody several years later said Charlie Halleck didn't have a thing to do with that. Had very little to do with that. I guess he went to the floor and got the uh, original manuscript with his handwriting on it and waved it. He said, I had a hell of a lot to do with it, by gosh, and he waved it at him. <laughs> Read this. So he was a fighter, you see. Truman vetoed it. The House and Senate overrode his veto, and so it became law. Now, Halleck didn't like Truman. Truman and Halleck were like cats and dogs. They didn't like one another. But Truman called, he always got along with the Democrats. And Truman called him over to the White House and he said, we need your help. Greece and Turkey at this time, communism was taking over all the Eastern European countries. And Greece and Turkey was about to fall. That would have meant the Dardanelles would have fall. That would give the Russians a warm water port on the Mediterranean. And Truman said, I need your help on this. We need $400 million for aid to Turkey and Greece. Charlie Halleck went back as majority leader, got it done. John Kennedy in 1961 stood up before a whole room of people. And he said, let me tell you something. We would not be in the position that we're in in Europe today if it hadn't been for Charlie Halleck. He saved Greece and Turkey from the communists. So when you're talking about power, you're talking about a man that had it, and he knew he voted uh, uh, for the good of America. In 1948, he suffered his most disappointing uh, political situation. He thought he was going to be vice president. He came twice this close to being vice president. And Dewey's man promised him he was the favorite son from Indiana. 29 votes were under his control at the, del at the uh, convention. He had the Indiana delegation. And Dewey's man said, if you get those 29 votes to us on the, on the first ballot, you're going to be vice president. He did it. He and Blanche said every place in, in uh, I think, the convention, I don't know where the convention was, but every place they went. Where was Philadelphia? Every place they went, they, Halleck's going to be vice president. Halleck's going to be vice president. And then Dewey held a meeting. Started at 11 o'clock, and it went to 4 o'clock in his hotel room. And they had open discussion on everybody there. And according to the people that were there, the two guys that shot him down was Dulles and Vandenberg. And they, 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 they just scotched him. Finally, they, they settled upon Earl Warren from California to be Dewey's running mate. It was, a better, it was a bitter disappointment for him. Dewey came to Rensselaer in 1940 and came to St. Joe Field House. It's the biggest, I tell my classes, and I think that's right, it was the biggest building in this part of Indiana by a long, long shot at that time. Dewey lost and Warren did not carry California. And he did not carry the coast states, which they thought he'd carry. And Halleck was bitter as a dickens about it. And he said, quote, Warren sat on his blank blank during the campaign. I don't know what blank blank was, but all the rest of the stuff I read in these books it must have been pretty bad. <laughs> he said if he'd have been vice president, he'd have got Dewey talking about the accomplishments of the 80th Congress. And they would have won because he felt that the 80th Congress had done a lot of good. In the election, Truman won, and also the Republicans lost the Senate and the House. So now Martin becomes minority leader. Halleck doesn't have a job because he refused to kick Les Aarons out of his job, who was right across the state line here, as the whip. So Halleck didn't have a job. He also re refused to kick the, the uh, committee chairman off of their jobs. He could have been in the Rules Committee because he'd been in that position before, but he refused to do that. He didn't think it was the right thing to do. In 1950, he uh, 
won by 19,000 votes against a dairy farmer from Logansport. And in 1951, after Truman fired MacArthur, Halleck escorted the old general, he escorted MacArthur to the rostrum in the house when he made his famous speech, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. In the 1952 presidential campaign, now this is, this is, uh, I got this Beth Conrad, uh, Roy Conrad ran the, the Conrad's restaurant in Monticello, sports and restaurant for years, and I worked there as a waiter, see, this is where I first saw Charlie Halleck, and, and uh, I went and talked to her, and she told me that Roy Conrad was right here when this happened. Halleck, in 52, Indiana, under Bill Jenner and a few other guys that were political bigwigs, they wanted to support Taft. And so they thought, if we let Halleck, in the delegation even, why he'll get around and get everybody swung over to Eisenhower. So they made it up among themselves that there would be a $500 entry fee to, in order to, to be in the delegation. And, and it had always been that way, but you could pay it after you'd been selected. So Halleck got wind of this, and he went over and got $500 cash, and went up in, they were in the Columbia Club, and he went up there, and she said Roy was in the room, and she said he was mad as a dickens, because Halleck was his friend. And there was a guy by the name of, there was a guy by the name of uh, Cale Holder, and he locked the door three minutes before 12. And Halleck's out there beating on the door. I want in. And when he finally got to him, they said, you're too late. So he wasn't in the Indiana delegation to the Republican convention, and here he was, uh, the, 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 you know, had been a majority leader in the House, and they didn't let him in. So he went unattached to the 52 uh, convention. So that just made it all easier for him. He just went to work for Eisenhower, who he liked and wanted, wanted to be president anyway, and Eisenhower got the nomination, and then Halleck was the head of his speaker bureau. So he, he controlled the whole operation. He also headed up his campaign train. And uh, Halleck, they, they let Halleck be the hatchet man uh, for Eisenhower, and he loved that because he didn't attack Adley Stevenson, he attacked, attacked Truman. And he uh, just had a great time getting after Truman, say. Well, the Republicans carried, carried both houses again, and Halleck won this time by 40,000 votes in this district. And uh, Eisenhower won by a turn over Stevenson, and Halleck is again the majority leader, and Joe Martin is the speaker. And by this time, Charlie Halleck is making 600 speeches a year. Now think of that, that's two a day. Beth Conrad told me, she said, he made so much more money speaking than he did as a congressman, it was unbelievable. But he was, he was just wanted everywhere. And so as soon as there was a day where he'd get away, he was out making two or three speeches because he was in such demand to speak. He had tea with Winston Churchill. He had dinner with Queen Elizabeth. He had dinner with Khrushchev. He was welcome everywhere. He was, he was just unbelievable. He missed the vice president, I, I forgot to tell you that. In 52, of course, Eisenhower had a little list in his billfold. And this list of candidates, he had written them out. And he had Nixon first and Halleck second. Until the day he died, Eisenhower he said he didn't care who was, he, the six guys he had on the list, he really didn't care. But the guy that took the list thought that he had them in the order that he wanted them. So they just picked Nixon because he was all right, and so Halleck mixed again by, by that much. Isn't that, isn't that something? They wanted to, I'm gonna tell a couple more things and I think I gotta quit then, right Judge? Um, in 52, they wanted two things. He wanted to cut the budget and balance. He wanted to cut the budget and balance the budget. And there was a man, uh, Ike wanted to balance the budget first. And uh, I've got that wrong. They wanted to cut taxes and balance the budget. And there was a guy by the name of, uh, I think his name was Reed from, yeah, Dan Reed from New York, and he was the head of the Ways and Means Committee in the House. 
And he had it in his head, he was 70 some years old, and he had it in his head that he wanted to cut taxes first and then balance the budget. And so Halleck got, Halleck was Eisenhower's man to get this done. And he always said that the toughest three hours in his life, he couldn't get it done with Reed. He went there and tried to get the Ways and Means Committee to change their mind. He talked to Reed, did everything he could do, and he wouldn't change his mind. And so he went to the Rules Committee. And he, he got the Rules Committee, and they didn't really want to do it. See, there was a little rule, as I understand it, that he could have pulled out of the hat to get the, to get the business done. And he, he, he talked and talked and talked and talked for three hours. And finally, the most decorated soldier in the house was sitting on this committee. And after Halleck had talked for three hours, he said, he said with tears in his eyes, he said, Charlie, I'm going to stick with you. Well, that was the vote he needed. So then they got the, the business that Eisenhower wanted done, done. But Halleck said, that was the toughest three hours I ever had in my life. Because he sat there and argued with these people and uh, enough said. 54, he comes back here. You'll see over here on the table, uh, he gets the honorary doctor of law from St. Joseph's College. He defeated James Berg by 23,000 votes. The Republicans lose the House. And, jo and Joe Martin had said that he would step down if they lost. But he reneged. So now Halleck's out of the job again because he doesn't have majority leadership anymore. And he would not take Aaron's job from him. I think this, uh, uh, I think that this, this is a good time to quit. We'll take a little break. I'll wind this up hopefully in about 20 minutes and then we're going to have some stories. Fair enough? Thank you. There's one thing, there's one note that I, that I uh, neglected to bring up that when he was the majority leader and Martin is the speaker, now this is a completely new role for Halleck because you see he'd been in the Congress for 18 years and he had never been in the majority, never been a leader in the majority. And so it was said he was always in the minority, so he was always picking on the, the leadership, you see, because that was his job. And uh, the, there was a quote that it said, that sound of ripping and tearing that you hear in the background is Charlie Halleck getting rid of all his old speeches. <laughs> in 1956, Eisenhower personally called him and asked him to nominate him at the National Convention for president. And he did that. Uh, th there was a hitch there. The, the teleprompter didn't work very well. And uh, it, it, his speech, he didn't feel like that he did a real good job. But Mrs. Halleck said, it was the most thrilling performance I ever saw Charlie give. I was so excited, I sat there almost like a bobby soxer. <laughs> During that campaign in 56, Charlie, they, they had a special airplane, and they called it the Charlie Halleck Special. And he traveled 15,000 miles in two weeks, 20 states, 30 congressional districts, gave 36 speeches, and the stump was instead of war, debt, scandal, and radicalism, the Republican Eisenhower administration has brought peace, progress, and unprecedented payrolls and prosperity. See, Eisenhower, I read this once, that Eisenhower believed very strongly in the word peace, that P words are strong words. And so it's interesting to note that in the stump address, <laughs> Halleck is borrowing from Ike and, and using this. In the second district, uh, Halleck won by 40,000 votes. He wasn't, even, he wasn't even here. And he won 94,000 to 54,000. Eisenhower, of course, carried the country. And in 1957, again, he could have been the Republican national chairman. But he refused to resign his seat to get the job. He also turned down vice president of Pennsylvania Railroad at $40,000 a year. And then his good old Indiana Republican conservative buddies 
uh, Bill Jenner and some conservative Republicans wanted to replace Halleck. Now here he is at the height of his power, and they said he was too close to Ike. Now who would you want to be closer to than Eisenhower in, in, this, in this, I'm talking about that day and age. So anyway, Halleck got him to Washington. He got him in his office, and he went to work on him, and when he got done, he, he said, you're not going to write me out of this party, and you're not going to write me out of this job. And he went ahead and he said to Jenner, he said, if there's anyone around here that needs to quit, it's you. And at the end, Jenner quit. <laughs> Jenner said, I've had enough of this. And so Jenner refused to, uh, Jenner didn't run. And then that brought about the race of, of uh, Hanley ran against Hardke. And uh, the Republicans lost that seat because Vance Hardke beat, uh, beat Hanley, mainly because Hanley didn't complete his, his uh, uh, term as governor. And the voters didn't like it. In 1958, that was in 58, Halleck spoke all over the country, but he only won by 6,000 votes. There was a guy by the name of, uh, well, let me see who that was. I forget, I forget, oh, uh, George H. Bowers. And he spoke all over the country, and the Republicans in 58, let me look at this again now. Anyway, he, was, he then challenged Joe Martin for the minority uh, leadership and Ike okayed it and he then ousted Joe Martin for the leadership in the house and Joe Martin was very bitter about this and Joe Martin when it was all said and done Joe Martin refused to make Halleck's nomination unanimous until a week later he was he was that bitter Mrs. Conrad told me she said it was really a sad situation because she said that Joe Martin had promised to step down a couple of times before and then he always reneged on his promise and then Eisenhower didn't want problems in the House of Representatives in the, in the Republican Party so they, they continued to have Charlie doing all the work but Joe had the job. And finally, it just got so Joe didn't do anything and uh, it, it came time for Char Charlie to take over Joe's position. That was when he got a nice big plush office and he also got a very small office off of the, uh, not very many feet from the house, uh, the floor, and he called it the clinic. And Joe Martin called it Charlie's drinking room. <laughs> and uh, I've read where it was nothing more than a broom closet, but he kept a couple of refreshments in there, you know, for people that he wanted to talk to, and he, he always said he'd get more done over a drink than you could over anything else. He, he, he used a coalition between the Republicans and the Southern Democrats to, uh, con to control the House, even though they were in the minority, the Republicans were in the minority. On March 10th, 1960, and there's Right over there someplace, there is, there is a, uh, there's mementos about this. There was a thousand people gathered in Washington uh, for the Indiana Society of Washington, D.C. to honor the Hoosier of the Year, and it was Charlie Halleck. And I came to that. The Eisenhower came, and he's made the following comments. You remember now that Halleck had only won by 6,000 votes in his own district. And he said, Quote, Charlie Halleck's loyalty to, to, loyalty to me has cost him votes in his own district. That kind of loyalty is priceless, and I know it. In 1960, the budget was balanced. In the 1960 campaign, Truman said, the Democratic National Convention is rigged for Jack Kennedy. And Charlie Halleck said, for once, I agree with Truman. <laughs> Halleck was selected in 1960 as the permanent chair for the Chicago Convention. And when he did that, then he gave up any chance of being vice president for Nixon. At home, it was Halleck versus Bauer again. This time he stayed at home and he whipped him by 25,400 votes. So it just a matter if he stayed at home, they were in trouble. Um, this was a time now when the Ev and Charlie show, which the judge talked about, 
uh, became a reality. This is 1960. And, it, and Eisenhower, it was Eisenhower's idea. And it was called the Joint Senate and House Republican Leadership Press Conferences. And that's what it was supposed to be. It was the Joint House and Senate Republican Leadership Press Conferences. But the Washington people called it the Ev and Charlie Show. And there were 22 of them held during the first year. And it was rather tragic, you see, because here's two guys that are really good politicians. And yet TV is starting to take over the political process. And they're competing against Jack Kennedy, and they're competing against Jacqueline Kennedy, and all of these young, good-looking people. And here are these people who have forgot more than the Kennedys knew at that point, but they didn't look so good on TV. And so they didn't really get real good press in Washington about this. And Halleck said, uh, somebody said it was kind of like a clown show once. And Charlie said this, I'm no clown, and I just don't care to be cast in that character. If you read the transcript of the things we've been talking about, you will find out they certainly are on a serious scale. Then Nixon and Ike, what they did to improve it, they started bringing in guests. And Ike was the first guest, and then two weeks later they added Nixon, and they started bringing in guests into this Irvin uh, Charlie show, and it, it greatly improved uh, the image because they had, uh, they had, the Republican Party at that time had great personalities, and so once they started using them, a little bit better why it really improved the situation. <coughs> Halleck effectively blocked the Kennedy New Frontier legislation. And the only thing they got passed was the Man on the Moon project and the minimum wage law. But everything else, he, he just beat him down. In, in 1962, of course now we're getting up here a little bit later, but anyway, we had Eisenhower Day in Rensselaer, Indiana, September 13, 1962. How many people in this room was there? The judge has told a personal story, so I'll tell a personal story. I was teaching at DeMont. It's the first year I taught. And I wanted to come to this because I was a commander of the National Guard company over here, and they wanted them to do traffic control. So they had a guy by the name of Jim Fritch that was the principal at DeMott, who was later the superintendent right here. And so I went to him and said, I want to get off and go down there so I can, you know, play soldier with the National Guard company. And he says, you can't go. So I thought about it a little while, and I went back and I said, I'd like to take my government class down to see Eisenhower and Halleck. And he says, you can go. <laughs> so I drove a bus, I had 57 kids in it, and drove a bus down here to Rensselaer, and I dumped them off, went over and got into my uniform, and played soldier, and they ran around this St. Joseph's College campus, and we had a time when we got back together. But he gave me an idea. There was a guy by the name of Wallstra, and he shook hands with Eisenhower. And all the way back home, he was, he was saying, don't touch me, don't touch my hand. I shook hands with Eisenhower. <laughs> well, you know, anything, if you're in the teaching business, anything that you can do to get kids fired up about government, it, it sticks with you. And so, uh, from that time on, the only president, I'm proud to tell you that I got an idea that day. And every time there's been a president, anywhere close, or a vice president, or anybody, I've taken them. You know, taken my classes so they could shake hands. I came right here one night. Halleck, uh, Halleck had uh, Thurston Morton in here for a dinner. I came right here and brought about 35 or so of them here. And then uh, Kennedy was coming to, uh, not uh, Bobby, was coming to, to uh, Lake County. And uh, so I called up the Lake County chairman. I was teaching, still teaching at DeMont, and I said, you know, I'd like to bring my class up. And uh, he said, well, he said, it's all booked. He said, there just isn't any room for you, for you. And he said, uh, you wouldn't be able to afford the $100 a plate, would you? And I said, no. I said, uh, I said, I'm really disappointed. I said, you know, the Charlie Halleck 
invited us and he said we were his guests here and Thurston Martin spoke and uh, my, my kids enjoyed that so much and he said uh, now let me call you back <laughs> he called me back and he said we'd like to have you be our guests <laughs> so they got in shook hands with Bobby Kennedy he got Anyway, there's 30,000 people here in Rensselaer, 16,000 chickens barbecued. I still remember the way that chicken, that chicken smelled, you know, over Rensselaer. They had them out there on that football field, as I remember, you know, and they were cooking them. And, and they dedicated this building that day. Uh, just prior to that, well, I'm not going to go into that. He started receiving numerous awards. He was a doctor of law uh, from Indiana University. And then he was the Indiana University Distinguished Service Award, which is the highest award that they can give. He got the Good Government Award from the Good Government Society in Washington, and that's, that's over there on the table someplace. I think it's the end, the end document. Um, and then the young Republicans uh, started organizing and uh, behind Jerry Ford, and they started wanting to move him out of his leadership position. And the first thing they did was in that year, in, uh, they, they, uh, there was a man by the name of Charlie Hovern, and he was a chair of the Republican Conference, and they were successful in putting Jerry Ford into his job. And uh, Halleck, Halleck worked to support civil rights legislation, and uh, Lyndon Johnson later on gave him full credit for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He said it never would have passed without Charlie Halleck and his help. Kennedy's assassinated. Two weeks after he's assassinated, Lyndon Johnson calls Charlie Halleck up and says, I'm going to come over and pick you up now in the morning. We're going to have breakfast. And so here's the President of the United States, rolls up to Charlie's front door in his limousine. Charlie goes out and gets in his car, goes over to the White House and has breakfast. And after they had breakfast, he asked, the reporters asked him what he thought of it, and he said, well, he had this special kind of thick bacon that a boy from Indiana would be sure to like. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, Johnson was the best politician of, of, all, of all presidents, in my, in my judgment. He was, uh, he was able to get Purdue several grants for a jet propulsion um, a lab and a, and a rocket firing lab. Uh, in 1964, his friends wanted to run Charlie for president. He said all he wanted to do was be Speaker of the House. At the convention, he introduced Ike, and he seconded Goldwater, and uh, the, uh, the Democratic candidate in this, in this district was a guy by the name of Joe Raber, or John Raber. And I kind of got a, I, I thought this was pretty interesting. He, he had a unique idea that he would pass out popcorn everywhere. So he went around the district in a mobile home, and he and his wife passed out popcorn everywhere they went. He passed out 140,000 bags of popcorn, that's two and a half tons of corn, and two tons of cocoa butter. But he was an amateur, and the, the Democrats didn't like him. They get, let him run against Halleck because they knew he couldn't win. But the Democrats didn't like him, and, and uh, he, he ran into all kinds of problems. And one of the biggest problems was he went to the to the West Lafayette, he, he, he had moved from Elkhart to West Lafayette, and he went to the West Lafayette Athletic Boosters barbecue. And he had this music playing out of his van, and so they got mad about that and told him to shut that music off or they were going to run him out of the place. So then he started passing out popcorn, and that made all the mothers mad because they was planning on uh, selling popcorn to, to, make, to get money for new uniforms for the football team. <laughs> So he had a terrible time in some places passing out this popcorn. And so Charlie ended up his campaign in Delphi, as he always did, and he said that he was going to win in spite of popcorn and that his medical experts had informed him that popcorn causes hemorrhoids. <laughs> Johnson, in 64, carried the second, the second congressional district, but Halleck won by 9,600 votes over this popcorn salesman. <laughs> the, the House Republicans, they lost 38 seats. And so now you got 100 out of the 140 Republicans in the House that got less than 10 years' experience. 
They're young, see? And so they called themselves the Young Turks. They wanted a pretty face for TV. And so that when they had their election for the minority leader, Halleck got beat by Ford, 73 to 67. And his comments were, quote, you can't take a Salakin like we took and not be in trouble. He was talking about losing the seats. And then his last comment was, I guess I got in the wrong kind of contest. I never figured to win a beauty contest in the first place. <laughs> now that, that's the notes that I have.